The American dream lives. The American dream is dead. <laughs> oh, what an idiot. Uh, oh, are we on? Are we on? The American dream is dead. A huckster, a huckster from Queens can, can suck in business, declare bankruptcy 87 times. Pissed through $400 million of his father's money in real dollars today um, and still get elected president of the United States and uh, still be walking around uh, free after stealing nuclear secrets. If that is not the American dream, my friend, I don't know what is. To talk about all that and much more, let's bring in senior writer at the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winner, David Leonhardt. He's the author of the New book uh, titled Ours Was the Shining Future, uh, the story of the American dream. I will tell you, uh, the um, opinion page editor emeritus uh, uh, just wrote a book on this, uh, Jerry Baker. Yes. Uh, and you and Jerry would agree that the American dream is dying. I take great exception with both of you. Yes. Um, what I find fascinating about your book, though, is you look at the, the right you look at the left and you say, you know, the right got a lot of things right that we in the press didn't understand. And the left got a lot of things right, but they also got a lot of things wrong. And you talk about how their miscalculations on policy have led to the destruction, you believe, of uh, the American dream. Or at talk least the that. decline of it. The and decline. I think we have to do things to, to really reinvigorate it. And I think we can, but we're not doing them right now. Right. So so let's talk, first of all, what did conservatives get right and progressives get wrong? So if you look at the 1960s, and it's, it, one of the things that was fascinating to me while writing this book is how the mistakes of the left in the early 1960s, you really see the beginnings of the mistakes that the left is making today, which is it is just incredibly dismissive of a lot of views that working class people have, a lot of moderate views. Back then, uh, it was things like crime. So in the early 60s, crime really was rising. And yet you look in, at liberal publications and they're putting crime in quotes. Right. And in the 1968 campaign... By the Gene, way, they're still doing that. But go <laughs> ahead. In the 1968 campaign, Gene McCarthy refuses to say law and order. And you contrast him with Bobby Kennedy, not Bobby Kennedy Jr., Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy. Who says, hey, progressives need to talk about crime. It's a serious concern for all kinds of people. And Bobby Kennedy was both a real progressive on economics and he was the most popular white politician in black America. And he talked really clearly about why it was so important. Bobby, to Bobby and it's what I loved about uh, him so much is he, he talked about crime, quote, law and order, however you want to put it. He also talked about justice. Yes, in every speech. He talked he did about both. He did both. And he gave the same speeches, whether he was talking to a white crowd in the suburb or a black crowd in an inner city, gave the same speech. And so what... What the Democratic Party basically left that model behind, and it moved toward a model where it is increasingly the party. It's an upscale party. The economist Tom Thomas Piketty uses the phrase the Brahmin left. Mm -hmm. It's increasingly a party of college graduates. Now, the Democratic Party is still interested in economic redistribution, but it can be disdainful of the views of working class people on a huge range of things. And in the last five years, we've seen the Democratic Party not only lose ground with white working class voters, but lose significant ground with both Latino and Asian American working class voters and lose right. a couple percentage points with black working class. So what, what did the left get right? and the right get wrong? Well, the Reagan revolution of, of the 1980s, the idea that we're gonna cut taxes and we're gonna open up trade to the world and we're gonna let companies grow as large as they can grow, that Reagan revolution, they said, this is gonna make life better for everyone. This is gonna bring prosperity for everyone. And it hasn't. I mean, in 1980, the United States had a normal life expectancy for a rich country. Today, the United States has the lowest life expectancy of any rich country What's in the that? world. I'm sorry? What's driving that? I think inequality plays a huge role in that. Um, inequality has increased so much. A lot of people can't afford schools and the best homes in the best school districts. Right. They can't afford the best health care. And if you look at the statistics, life expectancy for people who have college degrees is still doing just fine. Right. That, that stagnation is driven by people who don't have college I have one degrees. more question that I'm going to turn it over to everybody else. I don't mean to hog you here, but I'm so fascinated by this. Um, you, you, you know, you also see life expectancy going down, mental health uh, problems rising, uh, de death and despair. 
uh, for a certain segment of, of the population. And we talk around a lot of stuff, and I, I, this is just, I guess it's just because of my background and my beliefs. But I also think the right got it right uh, when they talked about the importance of church, yeah. the importance of synagogues, the importance of community, the importance of faith, believing something bigger than yourself that, that brought people together. Yes. And I remember time and again, we'd be in Sunday school class and there'd be one person that would come and say something crazy. And we'd all look going, no, no, let's, let's go ahead, open up to Luke and let's talk. But, <laughs> but there, was, there was this community that would, if somebody was ready to stray, would pull them back in going, no, no, listen, let's, let's talk about that. That's some, that's, we don't have that uh, as much anymore. And the Rev can tell you that. Uh, but that's something that, that the, the right has talked about for a long time. Faith, faith, we faith, have, faith. We have lost community in both the right and left ways. So I agree with you about religion. We've also lost labor unions. We've lost companies that cared about the cities that they were in. And I know you tend toward optimism about the American experiment, and I actually do too. Right. I think when you look at that, I think the solution to a lot of our problems involves political organizing and involves actually trying to have our political system improve the living standards for most Americans rather than be distracted by all this junk that we're distracted by now. So, uh, David, let's talk about the, this idea of the American dream and earning more than your parents. It, in 1940, 92% of people earn more than their parents. And there was always this expectation that the next generation will do better than the last. That's not necessarily true anymore. So how did we get to that place? And also it kind of speaks to the larger malaise among young people in this country about where their lives are headed. What all goes into that? Yeah, so as you said, this economic research shows that in, if you're born in 1940, you had a 92% chance of out-earning your parents. And that's really important because a lot of those people were laid off at some point, right? A lot of those people grew up in an economy that was horribly racist, that had all kinds of problems. So I'm not saying the America of the 50s or 60s was something we should aspire to get back to. We should leave it behind forever. But life was at least getting better for the vast majority of Americans. The black-white pay gap was shrinking during those decades. The black-white life expectancy gap was shrinking. And then we moved to this model where people stopped caring about community. And we stopped having corporate executives who were invested in their communities. And we had corporate executives who tried to make absolutely as much money as they can. And both parties moved to this model where we opened up the US economy to trade from around the world. And we said, that's going to work out great for us. And it hasn't. And it's really interesting to see that a lot of those other countries didn't open up <clears throat> trade in the same way we did. And I just think we've lost sight. Capitalism is the best system we've ever developed for lifting living standards, but not every form of and, and, and can I just really quickly, before we go to Rev, on trade, because I've had the same frustration as you. I'm for free trade. I believe in free trade. But it's got to be fair trade. Yeah. And I, I noticed it started with Reagan. But I noticed that Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, every Democrat that followed sort of did the Tony Blair move where he basically said, we're all fat Margaret Thatcher now. So they adopted Reagan's beliefs. Clinton adopted a free trade, uh, almost, almost unquestioning free trade. Uh, and and that is, that's continued through. And even on taxes. You know, the Democrats had a chance when they ran the House of Representatives to pass a tax bill that that got rid of carried interest, that got rid that that raised ca the capital gains rate, which is just outrageously low, which means secretaries are paying a higher tax rate than people who are living off of just moving paper around. Yeah. And Democrats didn't do it. I'm not I'm not saying it's the Democrats to blame. I'm saying it's become institutionalized yes. now with both parties. And the same way I think it's important to go back and look at what the Reagan <clears throat> Revolution folks promised about what it would do for the economy. Look at what free trade people said about what it would do. They said it will benefit all Americans and it'll make China freer. David, uh, over two. What what do you think that uh, a lot of it has to do with leadership? I'm listening you talking about Robert Kennedy Sr., who had the courage to stand up and say things that others weren't saying. How much of this is the leadership on the left and the right goes uh, by what they think is popular rather than what they think is right? And, and I think what made D Dr. King different and others who would stand up. I mean, Dr. King in the middle of the black power era said, no, 
I believe in nonviolence resistance. Bobby Kennedy would talk about uh, justice, but also policing. And did we lose a sense of leadership in the country where they would run and try to catch up with the parade rather than try to guide the parade to go the right way? Yeah. And one of the other fascinating things about Dr. King is just how much he talked about labor unions. Yeah. That they were absolutely. I mean, labor unions really built the civil rights movement through A. a. Philip Randolph and right. Dr. King. I think what's so tricky about leadership is you want people who can both inspire and move the population and also people who respect the population. And that's one of the things that really struck me when I went back and read about Bobby Kennedy and dug into the records on his campaign. In some ways, he tried to move the country, but he said, I'm not going to be disdainful of your views. I'm not going to take your views on all these issues and say, if you have these views, it's because you're ignorant. And I think too much of our politics today takes a whole bunch of issues and says, if you don't agree with us totally on this and that and this and that, it means you're ignorant. And I think that's one of the big mistakes that the Democratic Party has made and one of the reasons why they struggle with working class voters. I'm excited to read this book because you use history to tell the economic story. And you talk about Dwight D. Eisenhower, who I think is the most underrated president. How was he able to do what he was able to do in terms of building up American infrastructure? And that just kind of seems to have left the American political scene. No one's done it on such a scale since. Yeah, I think I agree with you that Dwight Eisenhower might be the most underrated 20th century American president. I mean, people think of him as the sort of doddering mm -hmm. figure from the 50s by the end. But actually, he did these incredible investments in the country. And he was also a fiscal conservative, so he was cutting other forms of spending. But he realized that highways and research and development and education, you can actually increase that spending while cutting other forms of spending. And whether you're a small government conservative or a big government progressive, one thing I would urge people to do is don't just focus on the size of government. Focus on is it focused on the future or not? And we now have a government that is so much focused on the present and the past than the future. We have a government that is much, much less generous toward children than it is toward people our age and toward retirees. And that just seems short-sighted. All right. The new book is titled Ours Was the Shining Future, The Story of the American Dream. This is a must-read book. David Leonhardt, thank you so much for being here. We Thanks really so appreciate much. it. Thanks, David.